Permaculture is a way of thinking. It's a way of seeing. And what I'm going to present to you tonight is a way of seeing ourselves as biological organisms who are deeply rooted in the life matrix of planet Earth. And by that I mean, what does it mean to begin to live in ways that intentionally participate with evolution? What is our new cosmology? What is our new story? How do we take the latest insights of physics, which is the root of the tree, of geology, which is the trunk of the tree, of chemistry, which is still part of the trunk of the tree, into biology, which are some of the branches of the tree, into anthropology, which we're getting into smaller dendritic sub-branches, into sociology, which is even softer science, and psychology. And to what degree can we inferentially, deductively create a storyline that integrates the salient insights of all these different disciplines? That's the mistake of the way in which education is done in this culture. It doesn't bother to integrate the insights of the different disciplines. It tends to segregate them into an academic narcissism. So I'm not presenting science as some sort of like hallowed holy grail, but it is certainly the new religion of this culture. And if we want to figure out how to frame a new direction for our society, I think it behooves us to know some of the foundational, fundamental, scientific understandings that back us up. According to astrophysicists, the oldest stars and the age of our universe is about 14 and a half billion years old. The galaxy is something that there are many of, as we know, in the universe. And we are in an outer arm of the Milky Way galaxy, which is one of many galaxies. I like to say we are spinning with the Earth, spiraling with the galaxy, and expanding with the universe. My point here is to say this is a very dynamic system. It is something that has been around for 14 and a half billion years. So this is an ancient universe. We have a huge inheritance. I like to say that we are the biosphere and how we behave now really determines the future. Everything on Earth that's larger than hydrogen and helium, if you looked at that table of elements and your eyes didn't blur over in your chemistry class, and you had to answer from a physics perspective, where did everything on the planet, according to modern physics, that's larger than hydrogen and helium, where did it come from? It had to come from the center of a star because the only place where you get physics that cause elements to compress and form larger elements is in the solar nexus of a nuclear fusion furnace. And the only place that exists in the universe is in stars. And so that's why people have said before in songs from the late 60s that we are stardust because that is actually exactly what modern physics is saying. And it becomes very important when we start to think in terms of what is our inheritance? What are we made up of? What sort of innate, inherent cosmic energy resides in the very fabric of our being? You hold wisdom that predates this planet itself because everything in your physical body, everything on planet Earth that is larger than hydrogen and helium had to come from a center of a star in another solar system before this planet ever came into existence according to modern physics. And what it took to make uranium-235 is a particularly huge star, like a neutron star or a quasar, which are the things that are at the edge of what we can see with the Hubble telescope. And remember, science's understanding of the world is limited by the technologies that it uses to understand the world. Therefore, we want to recognize what Marshall McLuhan said about technology which is that a technology is useful insofar as we recognize its limitations. Let's recognize the limitations of language. Let's recognize the limitations of mathematics. Let's recognize that they are tools. They do not apprehend the fundamental nature of reality, but they're a good guess, right? They see a little pie slice, just like our senses see a little pie slice, right? Our eyes see Roy G. Biv, but we don't see ultraviolet. We don't see infrared. But bees see ultraviolet, snakes see infrared. So let's think about our physiology. Let's think about what's going on in this solar system. The Earth is about 
92 million miles from the sun. The sun is the biggest act going on on planet Earth. If you want to understand why the climate changes on the Earth, you need to understand the sun. The sun is what's driving the entire system. The sun is 90% of the mass of our solar system. All the rest of the mass that's settled into the planets out of that cloud of stellar dust from previous explosions of suns settled into the Terran planets, right? Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and then we have the Jovian giants like Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, Uranus, Pluto, right? That's only 10% of all the mass. 90% of the mass is in this nuclear furnace, which has increased in its intensity by 30% over its lifespan. The sun has gotten 30% hotter in the last four and a half billion years. So the Earth is about 24,901 miles in circumference. It has a core that's spinning faster than the outer surface of the planet and is a thermonuclear furnace at the center of the planet. The center of the Earth is made up of uranium, nickel, cadmium, thorium, and iron. And it's burning at about 7,000 degrees Kelvin. And it's why this planet has a live geology in contrast to Mars, which does not, which is part of why Mars froze up tectonically and does not have water at its surface. One of the key things to planet Earth is the fact that we have a highly radioactive nuclear core and that this is causing an EMF field that far expands the surface of the planet in the atmosphere. And the EMF field of the Earth, the electromagnetic field that's generated by the spinning of this core, which we have both a liquid core and a solid core. And when the liquid core and the solid core interact with each other, it creates what's called a dynamo effect. It's the same thing that happens in the alternator in your car, which is when you have one type of metal like iron and you spin it in a bundle of another type of metal like copper, it creates an electrical field. This is exactly what is happening with the Earth on a large scale. The Earth has different metals in its crust and different metals in its outer core than it does in this liquid solid core that is burning at 7,000 degrees Kelvin. And that is what is creating this electromagnetic field that far extends out past the surface of the Earth. Aurora Borealis, the Northern Lights. The Northern Lights are a result of this EMF field interacting with the solar plasma that's constantly pouring over the Earth that if it weren't for the biosphere would be frying us. Because our experience of life on Earth really is something that is being provided by the way in which, and this is what scientists like James Lovelock, Lynn Margulis, and Dorian Sagan have been talking about, which is how does the Earth work as a meta-organism? If we think of the Earth as a biological entity, and we ask ourselves, how does it work? What is it doing? What these physicists and these biologists have been starting to refer to the Earth as is a superorganism that they call Gaia. And the Gaia theory is the idea that Earth is a self-regulating organism. And it has been used throughout physics to determine whether or not planets that we're seeing through the Hubble telescope are likely to be supporting life by looking at significant color signatures that have been picked out to show that in fact you can tell when there's life on a planet if you are seeing a particular wavelength of color. And this is part of what new biology and what Gaia is working on is an understanding of how does this planet work as a meta-organism. And what Gaia theory is saying is that in fact what physics and what biology are discovering is that life has begotten the circumstances that benefit life. In other words, what life has been doing is making life good for life. And it's been doing that for four and a half billion years and it's been doing it very successfully. That's why I like to say I'm banking on biology and ecology, not technology. Because if you think about what's been making it possible for us to have a comfortable ride on Spaceship Earth, as Buckminster Fuller calls this planet, it is the biosphere and how it's been working, and that's why we're talking about it tonight. Because it's worth your while to understand this as a human being on this meta-organism so that we can understand how to live in ways 
that synthesize with the larger dynamics of the planet.